Last week I began this four-week series on, like as our church heads into a new season, bringing back the theme that we began with the year with no holding back. And what are the areas that God is kind of coaching us into of not holding back into this new season? Last week, I began with what I called evangelism synergy, evangelism synergy. In one 30-minute message, it's probably my magnum opus as it relates to evangelism and its core and why and how. And I would really encourage you to kind of catch that on the podcast or uh, go back and listen online as I really talked about the value, the purpose, how we do it together, the significant aspect it is to our church. This week, I'm going to talk about the second um, key that I believe God's pushing us into, and that is leadership expansion. Leadership expansion. One of my favorite quotes in leadership comes, doesn't come from, I don't, I don't see, find any historical evidence that he was a follower of Christ, um, Napoleon. Odd, odd, but here's his quote. A leader is a dealer in hope. That is a great quote. That, that, is, that, that shows the supreme understanding of a leader's opportunity and ability and what people need. We all need hope. Scripture talks a lot about hope. It talks a lot about hope and how Jesus is the one who brings us hope. So our leader's responsibility, according to Napoleon, they're a dealer in hope. How then, as we're called in leadership, are we to be this, these dealers of hope? Leadership costs something. Leadership is not easy. Um, There's a price to be paid in leadership. But the price paid is always less than what we receive as we lead and what we give as we lead. My favorite church quote around leadership comes from now a retired pastor. He's probably said it about 30 or 40, maybe 30, 35 years ago. He said that the church is the hope of the world and its future rests in the hands of its leaders. The church is the hope of the world, and its future rests in the hands of its leaders. Now, we have a complete understanding that the hope is Christ, and the future of the church rests in his hands, but he's chosen to commission with us together as we lead. I want to talk a little bit about today... um, the whys of leadership is where we want to begin. The whys of leadership. There, is, there has been a dis, disproportionate amount of books written about leadership and conferences on leadership over the last three decades than there, than there has been to actually people leading. You know, I heard someone uh, characterize our country's leadership over the last decade as lacking in competency and character. Competency and and character. So as much as we talk about leadership, and if you did a search on leadership in Google right now, in like a nanosecond, you'd have something like, you know, 300 million different kind of hits. But what is it about it that we just can't seem to follow? I'm a big Survivor fan. I've told you that. This is year 20. Believe that or not, year 20 of Survivor. 40 different seasons of Survivor. I've watched, I think, every single season. I made the mistake in one Sunday, though, telling, some, telling you guys that I was, like, the world's biggest fan. And somebody afterwards questioned me on a couple kind of characters on Survivor, and I couldn't recall who they were. And she got mad at me and told me I wasn't really a fan. And she left, and I haven't seen her since. So I don't want to prop myself up as a Survivor, like, super fan. Um, but you ever noticed, if you ever watched it, the first person voted off the island is always the self-identified leader. <laughs> They're the ones who say, I'm a leader. And, and the reason why they get voted off first is because they have a, the wrong why around leadership. Their why is, I want to be the center of attention. Um, you need me. I'm smarter than you. Uh, they, they have the wrong why. And it's easy to have the wrong why around leadership. And when you have the wrong why, that's why it's, wrong. It's, it's really hard to follow people with the wrong why. All right? So let's start with why. Why do we lead? I came up with at least four reasons straight out of Scripture of the whys of why we should lead. Basically, the, the benefits or what kind of happens when we lead. The first one is because we lead because leadership blesses others by revealing Christ. It blesses others and it reveals Christ. Now, where does that come from? Well, first it comes from the book of Genesis. We have Abraham. Abraham was this nondescript person. You don't hear of Abraham ahead of time. Abraham wasn't big, was was wasn't full of notoriety. And yet God chooses Abraham in order to start this nation known as Israel. He tells Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. But then he tells them why. 
so that I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing. And so Abraham's leadership of leaving a place where he knew to go to a place that he did not know yet provided blessing because here comes Israel. So, so Israel introduces the world to the great I am. And then with the incarnation, Jesus coming out of Israel, we have the great I am in the flesh. Okay, So Abraham's leadership blessed and revealed Christ. Well, in Proverbs, the writer says this, Where there is no vision, people perish. Where there's no vision, people perish. The message version says it this way. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are the most blessed. I find a lot of people tripping over a vision for their life. Not just like this profession for their life, but the vision for their life. Why are they here? And then even when we kind of land on that, we... We trip over, the big thing we trip over is that, that we're here in order to, you know, to glorify God, to enjoy Him forever, that God has a call on our life, there's a vision for our life, and it's difficult sometimes for all of us to see that unless we have someone else actually helping, leading us through this process. The why, the why of leadership is to bless people and to reveal Christ. So the question is, do we need less blessing and less revelation? No, we need, we need more blessing, we need more revelation, so that would, that would lend itself to this idea that we need more leadership expansion. So we lead because people need to be blessed, people need to re- see Christ. The second is we, why leadership is because leadership reduces pressure and it increases peace. Leadership decreases pressure increases peace. Where does that come from? I'm going to read out the New Living Translation, 10 verses out of the book of Exodus, chapter 18. This is going to be a kind of scripture-heavy Sunday, so if you want to, you can read it or you can open your Bible. It says, the next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are, you, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around from you morning till evening? Moses replied, because the people came to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me. I'm the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give him his instructions. <laughs> his father-in-law responds with, well, that's not good. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job's too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice, and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees, and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But let's select people, select from all the people, some capable, honest men who fear God, Hate bribes, so here's competency and character. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. And here's the key. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures and all these people will go home in peace. Moses listened to his father-in-law. I would always suggest that, by the way. Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice and followed his suggestion. Someone's always leading. If something's going on, someone's leading. And when you choose to put leadership beside someone else, it reduces the pressure. Another proverb says that many hands make light work. You reduce the pressure of that load, and with the reduction of that pressure, the peace of who's being served in leadership, it increases. It, it's, it's almost its own natural law. And so I would say, would, be, would there be needing less pressure under leadership or more pressure under leadership? Is there a need for more peace in the world and the people around us, or is there a need for less peace? This is the case of having the right 
wise. Why do I step in and lead? Here's the third. Because good leadership, frankly, just produces results. It just produces results. Here's Acts 6, 1 through 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word, which was their core competency. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, who in fact becomes the first martyr, Stephen, and it's the launch of the global launch of the church happens with his martyrdom. And look where he steps up. His first role in leadership is to take care of a significant a need among the people that wasn't being met. Now, I don't know if he volunteers for martyrdom, right? But he volunteers here that leads to something else, right? So a man full of faith, Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. But listen to the result. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests, so it even crossed back over into the Jewish faith, became obedient to the faith. Why? How? Because someone led, and when more people lead, progress happens. In any kind of organization, church or otherwise, whenever there is expansion, it creates problems, right? It creates problems. Now, someone say, well, those are good problems to have, but if you ever led through problems, they still need someone to lead through them. Lee University has grown rapidly over the last couple of decades, and um, they do a um, Ask the President um, chapel service once a semester. And and this was, this was told to me that um, one of the questions he gets frequently is, why is there such a parking problem at the university? Now, because it has expanded rapidly and expanded buildings and the like, there's had to expand parking all over the place. But here's his response. It's classic. He says, Lee University, Lee university does not have a parking problem. It has a walking problem. So when you add up enough spaces, there's enough spaces for the student body, they just ain't where you want to park. But with the growth of the campus, the growth of the student body, it caused problems. And you say, well, those are good problems to have. Yes, but there's still, there's still things that have to be led through, right? And so as a church, as an organization, as anything grows and expands, it creates gaps in leadership. And the, and the, and the great why here is when someone steps into that gap, regardless of what that gap looks like, the success, the growth of people coming to Christ, it happens. We're responsible for process. God is responsible for product, okay? We step in to lead. God then changes the game exponentially when we play our part in leadership. That's a why of leadership. When I get involved, growth happens, and it's interesting, the more the followers increased, the more the leadership had to increase, which gave capacity for more followers to increase. It, it, I, in my opinion, in churches specifically, they become, I call them lids. And you have to remove certain lids in order for the church to continue to reach more and more people. And, and it, it really becomes a, a matter of looking at where those lids are. Lids ca happen um, all over the place. Our facility was one of our lids. That's why, we were, that's why we were building. We weren't building because we wanted, you know, carpet instead of concrete. Okay? So, so you remove lids. Leadership becomes a lid. The increased pool of leadership increases the number of people can reach. All right? Everybody with me? Here's the fourth. The fourth why of leadership um, is because the body needs me to be complete and I need the body to be complete. Body referencing the church. Christ is called Christ's body, the church. So here's my reason. The body needs me to be complete. And I need the body to be complete. Here's how Paul states it in 1 Corinthians. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. 
There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, male or female, slave or free, we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not be for that reason stop being part of the body. Well, I want, to be, I want to be another part of the body. Well, we're the parts that were the parts, right? Uh, if the whole body were an eye, would this, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpre unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body. You get that? Every part important, every part playing the role. That's why there's no division in the body. There isn't someone walking around saying, I'm the most important, this all centers around me. But the part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you are a part of it. I serve because the church would be missing something without me. You serve because the church would be missing something without you. We look differently. We have different giftings. We come from different places. We have different perspectives. We have different tastes. And God weaves them all together for one, for one body. So let's recap. Why lead? Leadership reveals Jesus. Leadership needs to be expanded because more people need to re Jesus revealed to them. Leadership reduces burden, increases peace. Why do we expand that? We want less pressure and more peace. That simple. More leadership produces more success. We want more success, not less success. Success defined by people finding Christ. Broken people put back together. All right? Because something is missing. Why? Because something is missing when I don't lead. And, the, and, the, and I'm missing something when I don't lead. I think the significant reason why there's a shortage of people leading in Christ, leading in this church, is they, they don't have a good handle on the why. Now listen, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It's not about easy. It's about the why. All right, so too many times we talk about what's before why's, but that's the why. Now I want to talk a little bit about what. What is what is leadership? What is leadership specifically as it relates to the church? It is a people push back against the term leadership in church because um, I think they forget specifically what the Bible teaches about what that leadership is. It's servant leadership. It's servant leadership. The corporations that you work in generally have a top-down model of leadership, right? It's a, it's a triangle. Everything comes from the top. But the way the kingdom of God works is everything comes from the bottom. It comes from the service. So I have a friend that started a ministry in Atlanta. He was sent. He was sent as a um, he was sent as a pastor to a small mission church in downtown Atlanta. And his his um, his marching orders were shut it down, take six months and shut it down. And what it turned out being is. There were so many drug addicts and so many prostitutes and so many even gang members that started kind of showing up that actually the church starts growing and he begins this ministry called City of Refuge in the most dangerous block in Atlanta. And now it's this amazing ministry and has this backing from everything from Delta to Chick-fil-A and um, he wrote this book called Trust First. And kind of Bruce's secret sauce, we went to school together. Br Bruce had prostitutes babysitting his kids. And you say, well, probably wouldn't do that. Um, 
Bruce's philosophy was, as they started coming, I'm going to trust you. No, no other play, nobody else wants to trust you, but I'm going to start trusting you. And, and his book chronicles that story, but it's interesting, Charles Sinek, who is a person who kind of did this TED Talk, you know, start with the why, which is why I started the why. He writes, he actually published the book, and he writes this about leadership in the foreword. He says, unfortunately, the practice of leadership is so misunderstood, it has nothing to do with rank, it has nothing to do with authority. Those things may come with a leadership position, and they may help a leader operate with greater efficiency at greater scale, but those things do not a leader make. Leadership is not about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in our charge. It's about creating an environment in which people can rise to their natural best. It is a distinctly human endeavor. Now, I would deviate. Our leadership is not strictly human. But he says, none of us is an expert in leadership. The practice of leadership is a journey, and we all are students. It is therefore our collective responsibility to share the lessons, tools, and ideas that are helping each other, help, that are helping each of us become the leaders we wish we had, the, wish, the leaders we wish we had, so that others may benefit. And then he talks about the book, Trust First, is one of those ideas of how Bruce is leading. Leadership, leadership is about serving leadership. Whenever leadership serves the leader, it short circuits in its effectiveness. But whenever leadership is leveraged to serve others, when it's does it like that, it blossoms and it blesses. How do you do that? How do you grow up in this culture that says it's all about me? How do you change your leadership in a way where it's all about them? How do you do that? Well, Paul outlines Christ's mentality in Philippians chapter 2. One of, actually, one of the most iconic chapters in all of Scripture where he gives this window into Christ, into the incarnation. Listen to the first 11 verses. Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So don't do anything to serve yourself or to prop yourself up. So if, you have, if you've had any kind of connection with Christ, if there's been any little connection that's changing you, hey, then listen, make my joy complete, and let's, don't serve yourself and don't serve to prop yourself up. So, so by him bringing that forward, it has to indicate there's a natural tendency for us to lean the other way. You're with me? That's why he brings this admonition. So again, why does Christ come? Because it's easier to follow a person and an example than it is to follow instructions and rules. All right? So Jesus comes in the flesh to show us this example. And here he goes. He tells us, um, rather, here's the alternative, 3B, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. So when you place enough value on someone other than yourself, then you're going to serve them. As long as you place more value on yourself, you're going to want them to serve you. Wow. I didn't say that in the first service. Someone needs to write that one down. You are going to serve the person that you value the most. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. Now he's getting to the source of how we do this who being, very, being in the very nature of God did not consider quality with God something to be used to his advantage. That's why we have the temptations. When we have the temptations right after Jesus' baptism, he fasts 40 days and 40 nights, and it's hungry. Scripture says he was hungry. The first temptation the enemy brings to him is turn this, these stones into bread. Jesus' response is, man did not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What he is also saying is, God, I have not been given this power to serve me. I've been given this power to serve others. All right, so his first temptation, Jesus' first temptation is serve yourself and not others. And he passes. And being found in the appearances of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I, I, know, you, I know you get this part, but just let me, let me leave here for a second. Jesus just didn't die on a cross. He just didn't kind of submit himself up to die. 
He was, he was humiliated. He was brutalized. This, this wasn't just he decided to die for us. He walked through hell for us. He allowed there to be gloating over what was appearing of his death and his defeat. It is tough for me to keep my mouth shut when I know I'm right and someone else is wrong. It's hard for me to let them keep talking. Like I'm just trying to help them, right? <laughs> I mean, so, so, th so think about the crucifixion in, the, in that regard. He knew, and he knew so much that he, in his, one of his prayers on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. There, 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 there was a humility in Christ that Paul's saying, this is what you emulate when you serve. When, when, when you lead about you, you, you don't help anybody. You don't even help yourself. But when you lead like Christ, when you serve like Christ, not only, not only does it change you, it changes other people. He ends, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and the glory of the Father. Matthew 20, Matthew records um, Jesus overhearing a conversation with his disciples. And they're going back and forth on who's the greatest. I mean, it's, it's almost comical if, it's, if it wasn't real, right? Jesus is in their midst and they're having their own back and forth in the same room about which one's greater. No, I'm greater. No, I'm greater. No, I'm greater. I mean, they sound like you know, a couple eight-year-olds. Jesus responds, you want to know who's greater? The one who serves is greater. Next discussion. John records Jesus giving an example. The Last Supper. They would, have, they would have walked to this room. They would have been partaking in this festival. Um, there would have been a bowl of water at the door for them to wash their feet, or there would have been a servant in any other context, a servant to wash their feet. In this case, Jesus gets up from the table, girds himself like a servant, giving a very visual demonstration of what this looks like. Okay? He didn't just act the part. He actually even looked the part. He girds himself, he goes over, and he washes their feet. And he tells them that this example is how they should love one another. Serving one another. That's what leadership looks like in the body of Christ. The wise, it always is going to produce. When you lead, it will always produce results in the kingdom. When we lead with what leadership looks like biblically, and that is we serve, and we love one another. The what's. The why's the motivation. The what's the identification. Let's talk a little bit about how. How. Peter Drucker, leadership expert, says that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Here's what he means. The atmosphere in your company, if I'll just, I'll, I'll try to throw it over here for you a minute. The atmosphere in your company trumps your product and your processes, okay? That if you have a toxic atmosphere in your company, it's going to impact the results of the company. You have a great culture and an average project and average processes, you're still going to be more successful, okay? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. An article that I actually read this morning about Dan Cathy, and Kat, Dan Cathy is one of the sons of Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A. Before Truett passes away and passes everything to his kids, he had them comp complete a pledge, really, of that they would always serve the Lord and keep the company serving its mission. And so what about that mission, about how? It's really about culture. Um, one, it talks about Chick-fil-A in this article that it currently ranks third in U.S. food chains with most sales in 2018 behind McDonald's and Starbucks. Okay? Although... Although there are only 2,400 Chick-fil-A's in the country. I think, I think we just got another one off 96, right? And you still probably got to wait in line, all right? Most efficient people I've ever seen. An average Chick-fil-A location earns $4.6 million, far outperforming its competitors. McDonald's comes in second at 2.8. Um, so is it easy to forget that Chick-fil-A didn't always have, have the market success it presently enjoys? Founded in 1946, the company had its worst year in 1982. 
the only year Chick-fil-A same-store sales decreased. The previous year, Chick-fil-A had experienced a major marketing failure. The U.S. economy was struggling, and the company, company was facing serious competition from McDonald's. Then the chief marketing officer, Stephen Robinson, said that the cash flow situation was dire. It was a real potential crisis. And even then, the leadership's Christian values guided their response to that impending disaster. At an executive retreat, Chick-fil-A's present-day CEO, Dan Cathy, asked an important question. Why are we here? In response to that question, the leadership prayed and there crafted Chick-fil-A's mission statement. It is on a, a bronze plaque outside of their corporate offices. I'll never forget, didn't know much about Chick-fil-A. I was a Yankee. They don't eat fried chicken up there. And, and I'm, I'm walking in the corporate offices, and this is what I read. Here's their mission statement. To glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us. To have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. You want to know why they say my pleasure? Do you, do you want to know why even this one on up here on the South Franklin where they've taken away the drive through window and put a door in and someone's standing outside to hand you the food? All of it's driven by culture. All of it. They made a statement of culture. Why did they get targeted? Because they've made a statement about glorifying God. We're going to glorify God. We're going to, glor we're going to honor. Isn't it amazing? I sound like a food commercial the last two weeks, don't I? Isn't it amazing that in a day and time where everyone's pushing, every, every employee is pushing for like family leave and, and all this kind of stuff, you have a company that has made a decision. They're a retail company. They're going to be closed on Sunday on behalf of their employees and to honor God. And they still outperform all these other restaurants. God honors right culture. Culture says, you might not even like chicken, but you like those people. So when a church operates in the right leadership culture, it creates the opportunity for, for people to say, I don't believe like they believe, but I sure do like those people. I don't believe what they believe, but I'd go to their church. So, so, so what, what does leadership culture, what are we striving for in a leadership culture at Gateway Church? See, if culture eats strategy for breakfast, then how we do something matters more than just what we do. So Mark chapter 2 is a, I mean, it is this kind of head-scratching story of why it even gets in the gospel. And it's about five guys. By this time, when Mark writes this, Jesus had rock star status. So if he was going to show up somewhere, people were going to show up because he was going to say something provocative. He was going to poke somebody in the eye. Or he was going to do something miraculous. I mean, he didn't just come in and give a talk and leave. And so he enters this town. He comes into this home, and people have flocked. And four guys had a friend who was crippled. And they said, we have got to get our friend to Jesus. They could have said, we're going to go hear Jesus, and, and Bob, we're going to come right back and tell you all about it. They wanted to get their friend to Jesus. So they go, and I guarantee you it wasn't the first time they carried this guy anywhere. They show up at his house and said, listen, we, we got to go see Jesus. We want, you to go, we want you to go with us. And they get him on his mat, and they carry his mat to the house. The problem is by the time they get to the house, it was so crowded and no one was going to let them in. They couldn't get anywhere near the house. Well, instead of saying, well, we gave it our best effort, they went to the roof of the house. They dug a hole in the roof. Now, and I want you to see this. They didn't, they didn't punch a hole in the roof. They didn't let the guy down. Hey, you hold on real tight. They, they let him down on his mat. So they had to dig a hole big enough to put a grown man on a mat and drop him down through the ceiling. I always wondered how Jesus managed that distraction. You know, first bit of stucco starts to fall, you know. And as they're lowering him down on the mat, now has everybody's attention, right? I mean, like, 
everybody is dead quiet. They're watching this young man being lowered to the ceiling. And Jesus looks up and he says this. He says that he saw their faith and he forgave his sin. Staggering. He saw their faith and saw what this kid's real need was. His real need wasn't that he was crippled. His real need was that he was broken without Christ. That was his real need. We get stuck on seeing upfront needs. And Jesus is teaching us how to lead that we see past, we see past what seems to be their need to their real need. Now the young man gets all the, way laid, all the way down. Jesus has seen their faith, forgiven his sin. But the ruckus in the room is, who does this guy think he is forgiving sin? So Jesus responds, even though no one's asked him a specific question, but he knows what they're thinking. And he addresses them. He says, well, so that you know that I have the power and authority to forgive sin, he tells the young man, take up your mat and walk. And the kid picks it up, steps up, and he walks out of the room. I mean, whew, some silence in the room. So where does, where does the leadership culture come out, of, come out of this story? Five different things. First, these guys decided to lead with love. Love was their primary motive. They loved their friend. They were, they were not going to... They were not going to let this guy stay crippled if they had a way to get to Jesus. So the second is then they led with service. They could have tried to love him a little bit maybe and said, again, you know, we'll tell you what it was like. But it took work. You do not, you know, you do not do this lightly, picking up someone and carrying them. It doesn't say how far he carried them, but. They're motivated with service. What does our culture want to be at Gateway Through Leadership? That love is our motivator. That we love others. That we will imitate Christ. We'll esteem others over ourselves. And when I value someone over myself, then I can serve them. I can serve them. And they said they led with unity. It took all four of them. You ever try to carry something big with somebody, right? You got to get coordinated. You got you to coordinate your efforts to get something from point A to point B if it's bulky or heavy. Recently this summer, we did um, we co-hosted a vacation Bible school with West Harpeth Primitive Baptist Church on the end of Hempex. Some of you participated with that. So two weeks after um, that event, I did a debrief with Pastor Hewitt Sawyers. Him and I went to Panera and uh, chatted about the experience for both churches. How did it go? How did he think it went? How did we think it went? And for 15 minutes, with the biggest smile on his face, he talked about you. He said, Charlie, the unity in which your people worked was amazing. I loved watching your people work together. It was heartwarming. I want to give, get that kind of unity happening with the people that serve at our church. And then he, then he said this. This one really warmed my heart. He said, I was sitting there watching. He said, I, I just watched. And I watched one person walk down the hall of my church and pick up a piece of trash that was in the hall and picked it up and took it to a garbage can and threw it away. He said, man, your people love well. How about that? That's just, I'm just using his words, not mine. Man, your people love well. Man, I, you know, I made me more proud than I could ever, ever be of him going on and on about how we loved and served and was unified. It was awesome. And then that we would lead with dependability. How would that scenario look if one guy didn't show up and another guy called in fashionably late? <laughs> yeah, I said I was going to come, but, you know, something came. No, they, they got together. They made a decision of what they were going to do, and, and they did it. And then they led with their best. 
in church circles and a lot of circles over the last couple of decades, this term excellence has come up. It finds its way into a hundred different mission statements that we're going to do something with excellence. Here's the problem I have with that term. Your excellent and my excellent look differently. Right? I said this in the first service. You know, Gina's going to make sure that there's no little handprints on the doors when you walk in and out. Me, I don't even think about little handprints on doors. Right? Her excellent, my excellent, two different excellence. So if we try to measure our excellent, you know, it doesn't work really well. But here's what does work for me. I know when I've given you my best, and I know when I haven't. I know when I stand up here and I've given you my best, and I know when I haven't. And you deserve my best. God deserves my best. And so our best might look different than one another's, but we sure as heck know when we've given our best or not. Let me tell you, tell you who else knows when we've given our best people around us. I really contend that people aren't looking for perfect people. They're not looking for a perfect church and they're not looking for a perfect pastor. But they are looking for people to give all they've got. Your heart, your soul. So there's what I want our leadership. I believe our leader, leadership culture reflects this. But as we expand our leadership, it's not about the nuts and bolts first. It's about the why. Why are we doing this? That we all have the same whys and we all have the same hows. We know what we're after. We're after servant leadership. And the more servant leaders we have, the more kingdom impact we can make. I, it's a lid. The more we have, the more people we can reach. Just like I said, that the guy named Middlebrook said evangelism, uh, it's a math problem. There's just not enough people doing it. I feel it's the same way around leadership. A lot of times I'll hear people say, I don't, I don't, know, you know, I don't have enough to offer. Or I, um, it's, a, it's a lie. It's, it's one of those lies that I hope I'll preach about in the next series. Lies we believe and the truth that drowns them out. I don't, you don't measure yourself against me and I don't measure myself against you. You don't measure coffee making or supply kids craft making or leading worship. They, get, they don't get defined differently in the body of Christ. It's part of the body. The body needs all the body. So we've done the why, the what, the how. You know, the who is, is you and me. We're the who that God has ordained, crafted, shaped, placed you to lead in this body and hear me say we need you oh pastor you need us because of this That no I, I need you because God's given you to this body and other people need you to, to, to kind of find that place in that role it's not an easy thing to lead it's much easier to not lead but I think we come up short when we don't lead and I know others come up short when we don't lead and so the where is here there are a lot of places where we need good, solid Jesus leadership. Absolutely. Lead wherever you are. But this still is a central place for us to lead. This is still a central place for us to lead. And that's why right afterwards, this kind of Say Yes campaign, the pastoral staff have gone to great length to, to highlight very specific roles that are needed for servant leaders so that we can expand leadership. And so at the end of the benediction, what I'm asking you to do is go, go have a conversation with someone. It's not just going to be a one-time thing sitting out there. Have a conversation with someone. Start finding a place to lead. All leadership matters. It all will expand the kingdom. If you take a moment and try to find a place, wherever you find it, it's not where you're stuck the rest of your life. I'm really not interested in trying to find volunteers to fill holes. Volunteers, that term in church world and anywhere else, I think it just sells everybody too short. Volunteer is the person that doesn't have the skill or doesn't have the authority or doesn't have whatever, and they're just doing whatever. I don't know. I don't see it that way at all. I think everybody has the capacity to lead because leadership biblically is defined as service and I think everybody has the ability to serve. 
I think we place leadership in all other parts of our, of our life on too high a shelf. Leadership in the kingdom is not a high shelf thing. It's a low shelf. Are we going to do it? And I love the fact that I get to lead with you. I love the fact that there are people in this room right now even, okay, that carried chairs and stocked trailers when we were portable. And they're still here. That there are people that have in the room that's given money sacrificially to buy the piece of property we're in, to renovate the house that we're off, off, officing out of. Those were two separate time frames. To build this building, that was a third separate time frame. And to build that building, that's a fourth separate time frame. There are people in this room that's given sacrificially all four times. All four times. On any given time, they could have said, I, 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 need, I need a break. And we, we exist because of the leaders that have served leading this point. And what I want to do in another five years is look at another group of people and say, you're here because other people decided to lead. You've met Christ because other people have led. Brokenness has been healed because you've decided to lead. This is not a speech. It's definitely not a um, motivational talk. This was a sermon on leadership and its value. Getting the right wise. Together, we can accomplish what God's called us to accomplish. There's a place for you here. Let me pray. Father, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for this church. Outside of my salvation and my family, Lord, my biggest thanksgiving to you is this place, these people. So, Father, weave us together even more tightly than before. Lord, so that we serve you in a manner where the gospel will spread rapidly. Why don't you stand? Let's, let's sing this bridge just kind of as our commitment today, and then I'll dismiss with the benediction. So I open my hands, I offer my heart. Oh, I surrender all back to you. I open my hands. I offer my heart. Oh, I surrender. service. Uh, Connect Center for these couple weeks has moved over here to our missions corner. I'd love to get a chance to meet you. I have a gift for you. We were expecting you to come today. Um, and we're thankful that you're here. Um, for the next couple weeks, you know, you're going to be dodging um, what would be considered a pothole in New York, uh, those big, large open gaps in the, in the um, uh, parking lot. But you find a piece of grass, park on it, you know, just thankful for fighting through that. If the Say Yes campaign's here. I just really encourage you to um, uh, to do that as well in small groups. I lead a group called Alpha. I don't have a representative at my table today. It's a 10-week introduction to the Christian faith, one of the best things I've ever participated in my entire life. It's going to be on Wednesday night starting September 18th. I'd encourage you also, if that might scratch an edge, to sign up for that as well. Now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his faith make, make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, and you're laying down, and you're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.